Wow. You know, when we are offended, we start imagining the worst about someone, right? We start imagining like, oh, I don't want to talk to him. I want to, I want to avoid him. Next time he comes to church, I'm not going to sit next to him, right? I don't want to be there at church anymore because, you know, that person seemingly uh, offended me. I'm not going to go to the family gathering because I don't want to see them. They're there. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, and so much that they were astonished and said, Whence has this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? If we keep going, uh, verse... 56 says, And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? 57, And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, and A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and, his own, and, in, and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. All right. So what we notice from this passage here is that this speaks of a peculiar people. It speaks of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that gathered around in the synagogue. And these were the same people that Christ grew up with. These are the people that Christ was surrounded with. These were the people that knew him better than anybody else. And yet when Christ came into the synagogue, what we read in the gospel accounts not just here, but in different instances and in different places, is that, is that Christ goes into the synagogue and he produces miracles. He heals people. He heals the sick, he heals the lepers, he heals the paralytics. And yet, instead of these very people who knew Christ, who knew him more than anybody else, instead of them rejoicing over the fact that people were getting healed, they got offended. That is what the Bible tells us. There was offense in their hearts. These were the religious, religious hypocrites that Christ contended against. Those were the religious hypocrites that Christ would have to try to convince that he was the son of God. Right? And what we see here, what we actually take out from this passage all the more, is that God cannot perform a miracle in our lives if we allow offenses to rule it. Right? Here, what it tells us towards the end is that Christ did not make mighty works there because of their unbelief. So, where does offense come from? The Bible tells us that it comes from unbelief. The fact that they did not believe, right? They lacked trust in the Lord. They lacked faith in the Lord. Hence why Christ departed from there. Instead of Christ, you know, doing the mighty miracles, which he would have done otherwise in different places where he had you know, crowds swarming around to come and see him where he healed hundreds or thousands of people. Here, he barely did one miracle. And when he saw their unbelief, Christ almost chipped the dust off of, her, off, off of his feet and he walked away. Because he probably thought to himself, well, it's not worth it. These people, you know, they're contentious. These people, they're offended. These people have a lack of belief in their hearts. So if we had to apply the same rhetoric, in our lives, how would this play out? Well, if we have to apply what we just read here, well, this tells us a lot about how we ought to be. It's like God is telling us that we shouldn't get offended. Because otherwise, consequently, miracles won't happen in our lives. All right? And what is offense? Offense, as I said earlier, it's something that stems out of unbelief. And what is unbelief? Unbelief is caused by pride, right? Being too, too proudful to believe, not being humble enough to believe. So you see how offense here, as we read of it, creates walls, walls in our lives, walls that prevent us from seeing the true glory of God fall upon us and fall around us. 
Christ was willing to make the miracles, but instead he did it right because of people's offense. And quite frankly, brothers and sisters, the greatest of all miracles, let's face it, is a heart change. The reason why Christ was actually making that miracle in the first place with that man in the synagogue wasn't just so he would, you know, heal the man. Of course, the man required help and Jesus wanted to help him out. But Jesus wanted also to prove to others that he was the Messiah, the one that they waited for, the one that the people of Israel waited for so long. And now that he has come on the scene and he's trying to prove them wrong with the theology and show them that he is truly the son of God by making all these miracles, instead of actually believing, they're contending with it. They're contending against it. They're getting offended in their hearts. So this shows a whole lot of pride and unbelief on their part, right? So God is not able to work miracles in our lives whenever we get offended. He's not able to disclose these great things so others could actually see, you know, what is going on and also be transformed. Because let's face it, the whole point of coming to Christ is to make a difference, right? We can't keep our faith for ourselves. A lot of people, you know, they like to tell you, well, my faith belongs to me. It is a private thing. No, it's not. When we come to Christ, when we are saved, right, that living hope that we have, we have to share with others. Just like Christ came into this world to change the hearts of so many. Christ came to seek and save the lost. Amen? And so that's the premise of the kingdom. Now that we are in the kingdom, now that we have been redeemed by Jesus, we also have to go and share the gospel message with others. But if we get offended by anything and everything, and that root grows in our hearts, then that makes it impossible for us to be a good testimony unto others. It makes it impossible for us to be, you know, people that can be game changers in our society. We can't transform the hearts of others if our hearts are not transformed first. Did you ever hear that saying that says, physician, heal yourself first? Right? So our hearts need to be healed from offense before we are truly able to bring a transformative change in the lives of others and before we're able to bring others to Christ. Amen? So out of all these people in that area where Christ lived, these people, they grew up with Christ. They knew him better than anybody else. They knew his mother, they knew his father, they knew you know, where he came from. And yet, Christ was rejected by his very own. Christ tells us that a prophet is not welcome in his own hometown. How many of you feel that way sometimes? As though the closest people to you that are supposed to understand you, understand the belief, uh, uh, sorry, uh, supposed to believe in you, are the very people that take you for granted. They take you for granted, and they hardly ever believe that you're able to do it, right? And usually, the furthest people away from you, who you don't know, are the people that are the nicest to you, who believe in you, who trust in your capacities. And that's a sad reality, but it's a common one that we see everywhere, but also in our churches today. In the body of Christ, that's something that we see happening a lot. It's almost like there's this sense of familiarity that settles in where people are too familiar with you because I know you, I'm your friend, I've known you for many years, I know where you come from, I know your parents, right? If you have something good to tell me, I'm not going to take it in. If you, have, if you have a good advice to give me, I'm not going to take it in, right? And what that creates, unfortunately, is offense, not just in their hearts, but also on our part. And that's why we have to be careful. Because offense, whether it be the person who creates it or the person that, you know, receives it, it's the same. It's something that God wants ruled out of our hearts. Amen? So offense is rooted in pride. And what offense does, it creates resentment and bitterness in our heart. When we resent a brother or a sister because of such and such, you know, we feel as though there's a wall now of separation between them. We don't view them the same way anymore. And eventually, as a result, that causes unforgiveness in our hearts as well. When we become 
unforgiving towards a brother or sister, it becomes very difficult for us to hear the voice of God. And I say this from my own experience. What religion, unfortunately, doesn't teach, or what society doesn't teach at large, is that unforgiveness is a root that is rooted at the deep core of our hearts that could cause a lot of damage in our own life and in the lives of others. Which is why, hence, it is important to ask God to root out unforgiveness. But unforgiveness comes from offense. And offense comes from pride. And pride comes from unbelief. You see how everything is just interconnected? Everything is just, you know, intertwined together. It's like a fishnet, right? Everything is just joined together. So we have to be careful to not have any offense in our hearts. Because otherwise, we won't be as effective and productive in the kingdom. We won't be able to work um, for the for the sake of God's kingdom the way we should. Brothers and sisters, resentment and bitterness is not an option for us. And when a door of offense is open, the devil, you know, takes that. He infiltrates your heart and he starts pouring in rage and anger. And before you know it, you know, you're coming up with your own ideas, uh, worse scenarios about someone else. They might not be what you think they are, but now you're actually dwelling on that stuff and you're going like, oh, he hurt me. We have to be careful. And of course, you know, there's something else that this actually creates. It's hindrance in our prayers, right? We go to God in prayer and if we don't repent from such thing, then our prayers are hindered, right? We wonder why God is not listening to us anymore. We wonder why God is not hearing us. We wonder why God is not to be felt in our hearts anymore. It's because God has kind of turned his back for a moment. Now, God is never too far away. He's always there. But he's trying to teach us a lesson. And the lesson is that you've got to root out the offense from the heart. That is why the sermon title is called Defenses of Offenses. What, are, what is offense? Offense is a separation. It's kind of a wall. And truth be told, it's not going to hurt anybody else but you first. Right? So that's why Christ calls us to forgive because he knows that there's freedom in that. Remember what we said earlier when I introduced the introduction sermon? We spoke about freedom. And the Bible says that, you know, that freedom that, freedom that we have in Christ, so they should not be used to provoke one another. As in, you know, to bring division between us and a brother or between us and a sister. Whomever that person may be, we must forgive all the time because that is the best thing to do. And hope also that God hears our prayers and forgives us because Christ forgave us a lot, right? I mean, let's put it this way. Christ died on the cross, a gruesome death for us when he didn't have to do it. I was preaching just a couple of days ago about the love of Christ right in the streets, on the street uh, when, we, when we met you guys. I was telling people, you know, imagine the love of God, how wide, how broad it is, that Christ would sacrifice his own self for the sake of others. And I was asking people, the bypassers, how many of you would be willing to die for a loved one? How many of you would be willing to sacrifice your life for a precious brother or a sister or father or mother? Most people would say, I'm not willing to put others first. And yet Christ died for a vile race of sinners. Imagine how sinful we were and how much and how great the love of Christ, that it would compel Christ to die on the cross for us. That's the love of God that a lot of us unfortunately don't understand even this day. Worse yet, a lot of people out there who don't know Christ, who reject Christ, they're not capable to understand that love because they haven't had a true encounter with the Lord yet. And that's why we pray for them. That's why we preach the gospel to them. But all that to say that, you know, it cost Christ's own life to forgive us our sins. So how much more should we forgive others? Because the servant is not above the master. If we are to lead in the, in the footsteps of Christ, then Christ forgave us everything. And we must forgive just like Christ forgives us. And I get it, it's difficult, it's not easy. Especially when your ego is hit, when your pride is hit. But brothers and sisters, that's 
explicitly what Christ is trying to work in us, a change, a transformation. And a transformation requires a sacrifice. Amen? We must sacrifice in order to be transformed. It won't come to us easy, right? That's why a lot of people don't preach about these things out there, right? But Christ tells us of these things because Christ seeks for us to be conformed to His image. And so if we were to look back in the Bible, if you were to look back in time and define where this began, where did this start? It started with Satan, right? Let's actually see what the Bible says here. In Isaiah 14, 12, speaking of Lucifer who fell from heaven, it says, how are thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Let's keep going. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And then it, it says to us, for thou hast said in, sorry, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Let's see what happens next. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So what do we see here? We see that Satan fell because of his unbelief in God first, right? And then second, because of pride. He wanted what the Lord most high had. That is why this says here, and we read, that Satan said in his heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. Well, Satan wanted is he wanted to rule like God rules. He wanted God's position. He wanted God's status. And he failed to get it. And then what happened? God cast him out of heaven. Right? And so, do you see how pride comes before the fall? When we have pride in our hearts, we will most inevitably fall. All right? Pride is offense in the heart. Okay? Satan was the first one that opened the way for offense. He opened the way for pride. Right? The reason why he does what he does today here on earth is because of offense. Right? He became proudful. He wanted what God had. Right? And so when God kicked him out, he became offended. So what does this tell us? Offense is whenever someone doesn't get it his own way. You know when you have high expectations towards something and you fail to, to get it your own way? You end up getting offended. If someone says no to you, but in your mind, it's supposed to be a yes, you're expecting already that the person will say yes. But when it turns out that it's a no, then you get offended and you harbor that offense in your heart. That comes from pride. And then with offense come, comes along all these other traits. You know, uh, rage, anger, resentment, bitterness towards that person and towards everybody else. And quite frankly, all of us have had that to a certain extent in our lives, right? But the reason why Christ came is to show us the nature of our hearts, right? So we may check our hearts out and seek to have our hearts come clean before the Lord. Amen? Now, here's what we need to understand. We can't do it on our own. There's absolutely no way we can root out that offense from our hearts. It is God that does it because Him alone has the power to rule out that offense in our hearts. Him alone, Jesus Christ, has the power to cleanse our hearts from such things. Because the Bible says that when Christ came into the world. He came to take the hearts of stone and exchange them for a heart of flesh, which no one else, by the way, is able to do. Because God himself, the Messiah, was able to break the power of sin in our lives. He alone, Christ Jesus, is able to overcome the root of sin in our life. An offense is obviously a sin. But where did it start? It started with Lucifer, right? He was a cherub. He was a beautiful cherub. He had everything for himself. God had given him so much. He was the angel responsible for music in heaven. He was responsible for worship. He was well-valued and loved by God. And, and yet, 
he still decided to rebel against God. And through his rebellion, he was cast out, him alongside one third of the angels. But before he was cast out, you know what he did? He went around plotting against God, murmuring in the ears of the angels, telling them that they also must rebel against God. That's offense, right? So there was a whole lot of bitterness and resentment in his heart. That is why today, every person that rejects the gospel, they'll reject the gospel because they're offended by the gospel. When we preach the gospel loud and clear on the street corners, most people, you know, they curse us. Most people, they attack us. Most people, they hate the message. Most people are indifferent. Most people, you know, they're thinking evil in their minds because they're getting offended just like their father, the devil. And I'll tell you why they get offended. Because it requires a whole lot of humility to follow God. It takes a whole lot of humility to deny yourself and decide to, you know, walk in the ways of God. Obedience, right, is a difficult thing to do. Most people don't want to obey because they don't want to change their lives. Most people don't want to, you know, check themselves out and, and realize that there's sin in their lives which they should eradicate, right? They want to justify their sins. And in justifying their sins, well, they remain far from God. Revelation 12, verses 3 and 4 says the following. Speaking of Lucifer, Satan, the dragon. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars, speaking here of the fallen angels. And it cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Here again, what we see is that we can tie up this verse here with the few verses that I gave you earlier. But then if we keep reading, verse 7 says the following. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angel. So what is Lucifer doing here? He is fighting God. Can you imagine? I mean, Lucifer knew about the status of God. He knew who God was. He knew that no one could ever overtake God. And yet he still decided out of pride, out of hatred to turn against God no matter what. Because he thought that he had a, he had a shot at this. He thought that if he gathered enough angels, one third of the angels, right? And got them to fight alongside him that maybe you know he'd have it his way which is to sit on the throne of god but then of course as you know the story tells us that he was cast out of heaven he didn't have it his way verse 8 says here bear with me for a moment and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And then let's keep reading. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And now I want you to focus here on verse 10, what it says. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. <clears throat> All right, we're going to stop here for a moment. So you see, do you see what, what is happening here? Satan gets cast out. All right. But the plan of God does not stop from getting fulfilled. God's plan of salvation is still going forward until this day. And if you look at what Christ did on the cross, the Bible tells us that he put Satan to shame. Him and his minions. Right? He defeated the power of Satan on the cross when Jesus died and rose from the dead. All right? And so no matter how hard Satan tried, he wasn't able to get in his way. He had such high expectations and he still ended up falling away from heaven forever and ever. And now he is so offended at God, he's so triggered at God that he's trying to bring as many people as possible to hell. That tells you a lot about the nature of the heart of not just Satan, but all those that reject the gospel message. They are offended 
Because it is a spiritual condition that starts within the heart. Offense is something that starts within at the very core of the heart, brothers and sisters. Now, offense is something that we Christians must eradicate at all costs. Why? Because it was never in Jesus Christ, nor will it ever be in Jesus Christ. If we are to be representatives of Christ on earth, we are to be everything but what, what, what Satan is. We are to be everything but what Satan is. That is the complete opposite of Satan, the complete opposite of the children of darkness. All right. We are to be loving, we are to be caring, compassionate, we are to be forgiving. And if we don't have these traits in us, let us introspect on our lives. Let us check our hearts out. Like Paul said, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith or not. Lord, am I walking in the faith? Am I obeying you? Lord, am I loving you the way I should? Lord, am I doing your will? Right? Because ultimately, this is what this boils down to. Doing the will of God. Remember, remember what Jesus said when he was in the garden. And you know this. I mean, you guys are familiar with the passage. Jesus said, Father, if it were possible, let this cup pass away. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will. It's all about doing the will of God. It's not about harboring offenses towards our brothers and sisters or anybody for that matter. Because that's going to create chaos in your own life and the lives of others. And you won't see freedom the way that Christ wants it for you. True freedom is when we forgive. Amen. So forgiveness is basically the antidote. Forgiveness is the cure to offense. Let us not be like Satan and his minions. Instead, let us be like Christ. Amen. So offense also makes us lose a sense of God in us because we are gratifying the flesh. We are not gratifying the spirit, right? You remember what Jesus said when he was here on earth? He said, if any man wants to follow after me, let him, let him deny himself. Let him pick up his cross and follow me. So there's a sacrifice there. Christ intends for us to sacrifice everything, to renounce everything for the sake of gaining him, right? And so that's why we must strive in the spirit to remain connected to Christ through prayer and through the word. That's how we fashion our lives, brothers and sisters. Not like the world does, but completely differently. All right. It's important to strive for a relationship with Christ because when, we, when you fall out from that relationship with the Lord, your flesh takes over. When your flesh takes over, then you start acting with impulses and passions. And, and mind you that the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. So you mustn't, you mustn't trust your heart. You must trust the word of God. You must trust the spirit of God to lead you to act and behave the way Christ wants you to do it. Are you guys with me so far? There's something else. What does offense do in our lives and also in our churches? It creates division, it creates havoc, because sometimes when we are offended, we go around gossiping about others. We go around tailbearing. We go around telling about what this person did or that person did. Right? A lot of us do. I mean, we have all done it. Let's be honest with ourselves. We have all, at some point in our walk with the Lord, gossiped about others. And we shouldn't. Right? Because the enemy is so sneaky and so subtle. And you know that. The Bible says that the enemy is like a lion. He's always prowling around, seeking whom he may devour. The enemy wants the smallest loophole to infiltrate. If you open up a door, an inch, right, he will come in gladly. And he will bring his legions of demons to destroy our assemblies. However, God, Jesus Christ is calling us to have perfect unity in our church circles. That's why we must leave the offense outside. And when we do get offended, let's actually, you know, make it to go to God right away and not waste time. Because trust me, I've experienced how damaging offense could be for my own walk and for the church. Because I have had had offenses in the past towards people. Because when people discourage you, when they disappoint you, when they hurt you, whether it's knowingly or unknowingly, 
it just grows a sense of offense in you now. You see how everybody becomes offended. And now before you know it, there's a spirit of offense that is hovering over the church. And now it's creating division. And now you're trying to fix things, but it's becoming almost impossible. Why? Because it's too late. You're losing your blessings. The church is losing its blessings, right? The enemy has come into the church. And now he is using the church as a playground to do whatever he wants. Brothers and sisters, we have a responsibility towards ourselves, towards God, and towards others to cut off the offense from our lives. Because offense brings, as I said earlier, once again, it brings a whole lot of stuff. It brings a dynamic that is evil. It brings gossiping, rage, anger, frustration, discouragement, right? And these are not things of the spirit, the things of the flesh. Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. These six, six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an, ab an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. A false witness that speaks lies, and he that souls discord among brethren. Brothers and sisters, do you notice what all these have in common? These come from the spirit of offense. Because when you're offended, right, you end up being proudful or haughty. That's the first one on the list. Second, you might even lie. Third, you might shed innocent blood. Not physically, but remember what Christ said. Christ said, if you hate someone in your heart, you already committed murder. Because everything stems out of the heart, right? Because the intention leads to the action. So if my heart's intention is hating someone, then even if I haven't murdered them physically, I've murdered them with my heart. It's like when Christ said, you know, with bringing this to a very deep spiritual profoundness, he said, if a man looks at a woman with lust, it's as if he committed adultery in his heart. So Christ is telling us that offense creates all these things. But if you keep going, verse 18 says, A heart that devise, devise, devises wicked imaginations. Wow. You know, when we are offended, we start imagining the worst about someone. Right? We start imagining like, oh, I don't want to talk to him. I want to, I want to avoid him. Next time he comes to church, I'm not going to sit next to him, right? I don't want to be there at church anymore because, you know, that person seemingly affected, uh, offended me. I'm not going to go to the family gathering because I don't want to see them. They're there, right? So you're going to try to avoid that person. So you're basically dividing an evil plot, an evil scheme in your mind. What else? It says, feet that be swift and running to mischief. Verse 19, a false witness that speaks lies, right? When, when someone hurts you, you get offended. Now, they, they probably they probably offended as well, but they got you to be offended. That's what the devil wants. He wants to turn people against each other, right? The division to better conquer. And so you're not to fall for that scheme of the devil. You're not to fall for that scheme of the devil. And finally, verse 19 says, He that sows discord among brethren. Wow. And I mean, this must be the most prominent one out of all these others, right, on the list. Sawing discord among the brethren. Wow. Right, sawing discord. Because quite frankly, let's face it, let's face it, the devil doesn't want us to come together. You see this, what we have right now? He hates it. We might not be a lot, but, but we're just enough to give glory to God. Right? God is rejoicing in the fact that we're here. Did you know that God is having a celebration with us when we praise and worship Him? So, anything that God values and deems good, yet the enemy wants to destroy. Because he has so much hatred against God. And so, if we are to, to come together and praise God, if we are to come together because we love God, the enemy will try to destroy this. It makes sense, right? So the list that we just reviewed, if this could be summarized to one, it would be offense, which comes from pride and unbelief. Because we want it our, our way, my way or the highway. 
not God's way, right? But instead, every day of our life should be, Thy will be done, O God. The Bible says, no matter what you do, do it for the glory of God. Whether you eat, whether you drink, whether you come together, brothers and sisters, whether you go to church, whether you go to school, whether you work. I'm losing my voice, I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to get some water. I'm coming out of a sickness, so I'm really sorry I'm losing my voice. That's not my usual voice, by the way, so bear with me, forgive me. It's taking me a lot of, you know, energy to be here this morning, but glory to God, right? It's a sacrifice that God will reward. <clears throat> There's something else, and listen, for the few years that I've been a pastor, what I can see is that a lot of us, we come with our baggage from the past, right? Um, we, we newly got saved. Uh, we were out in the world. Um, we, we become with Christ, and we're zealous, and we love God, and that's beautiful, it's commendable. But when we are overzealous sometimes, um, that could you know, bring damage to the people around us. Why? Because we think we know it all. We think that, you know, we, we have our act together. <laughs> that we understood everything. And we have to be careful because it's a, it's, it's, it's a journey that requires, um, like it's a marathon, it's not a, it's not a sprint, right? So let us not, you know, look at ourselves as wiser than the other person. And always seek to learn in humility. All right, because wisdom is justified by her children. Jesus said these words. Do you know what it means? Is that every person justifies why they think a certain way. Every person justifies why they do things this way. But you might be wrong in your justification. You might not know that you're wrong, but you might be wrong. And if you're wrong, well, that could bring also damage around you. All right. So that's why we must stay humble. We must stay humble and, and, and recognize that we don't know everything, that we're on a learning curve. The reason why we come into these assemblies is so we may learn from our brothers and sisters, so we may, so we may sharpen each other, like iron sharpens iron, right? There's just so much to take away from other people, so much to give, but let's do it reasonably. Let's not do it with confrontation. Let's not do it, do it by, uh, with provoking one another. Let's do it with humbleness. So back to our text, verse 57 says that we are offended at him in the book of Matthew. <clears throat> they were offended at him. Why? Because they could not believe that he was the son of God. They, they could not believe that he was the son of God. Jesus, I mean, you see it all throughout the book of John. How many of you here have read the gospel of John? How many of you have read the, the, the Gospel of John? The Gospel of John, brothers and sisters, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful eulogy of Christ going back and forth with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, trying to prove them wrong about who they think he is and, and trying to prove himself right. You know, Christ telling them, listen, if you're not going to believe my words, at least believe the works that I've done in your midst. I've done so much. I've done so many miracles. I've done signs and wonders. I, I've done more than anyone has ever done. And yet you guys are so dull of heart. You're so proudful. You're so hardened. And a lot of us, unfortunately, we can be like that sometimes. God has done so many things in our lives. God has brought miracles in our lives, right? He's changed so many things in our lives. Right? He's disclosed so much generosity. He's displayed so much mercy. We have seen him literally in everything in our life. We have, he's, he's walked with us every step along the way. And yet we are so quick to be offended at God sometimes. We get bitter whenever we don't get it our own way. Lord, why didn't you give it to me? I've been with you for so long and you're still getting offended. I mean, we all have been offended at some point. Because God didn't give it to us the way we wanted it. Right? 
And yet God has done tremendous things. He has loved us so much. He has cherished us. He has poured out his blessings from heaven. And sometimes we look back at the Old Testament, don't we? And we go, oh, look at the people of Israel. They're so dull of hearing and understanding. How could they reject God after the miracles that they witnessed in the desert? Brothers and sisters, that is us sometimes when we don't trust God. And I wouldn't be preaching this sermon if I didn't believe that this is a sermon that was tailored for me as well. All of us need to learn from this is that we must thank God for everything that we got. The reason why you're here today, this beautiful family, is because of a purpose and a plan that God has for your life. And same goes for you. Same goes for all of us here. I am telling you, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. For the Bible says that all things work all together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God has got a purpose for Sophie, for Kim, for me, for Adam, for Mom, for my wife, for everybody here, right? So we mustn't harden our hearts towards God and be offended whenever God doesn't give it to us the way we would like to. If God doesn't give you something, it's because he knows that you're not ready to have it, right? He knows that you're not in the capacity to act upon it. If God doesn't give you something right now, it's because he knows that you still have some learning to do. You still have some growth to do, right? Like a baby, for example. A baby doesn't grow overnight. A baby does baby steps slowly, slowly. And at the beginning, he falls. And then eventually, he tries again and again. And now he's able to walk on his feet. But he's still wobbly, right? So that's how we are when we come to the Lord. And God gives us a lot of you know, leeway at the beginning. He's very patient. That's why I'm saying when we come into a new assembly, when we join ourselves with brothers and sisters, let us all, you know, seek to, you know, listen and learn and, 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 and just give away from our knowledge, but never become too haughty or proudful as if we got it all figured out, right? Because otherwise that's going to create offense in our heart. Right? And it's going to bring offense in the church. And the devil will have his way into the church. And before you know it, the church is going to crumble down. Right? So, <clears throat> let's define the word offense. And please don't sleep on me. This is really important. You know, stay awake. Uh, we've got another 15 minutes to go. But this is really important. All right? So, what, what is it? What, what, how, how can we define the word offense? The dictionary defines the word offense as... To arouse resentment, anger, or vexation. To be displeasing to or to commit a sin, right? So offense is a sin. Brothers and sisters, in our text from earlier, Jesus' very own hometown people were offended by his ministry. A lot of people got offended of this ministry. A lot of people are still offended of this ministry today. That's why we get attacked so much by the devil in this ministry. Why? Because when you seek to do the will of God, Satan is going to have his gaze upon you. And he's going to try to make your life a miserable hell. Right? How many times have you seen division in this church? But we have learned, you know, the difficult way that we must pray and fast. Right? Just so we can avoid division to enter into our church. And thank God, God is still working this church. Like a lot of people are serious. A lot of people are not serious. But nonetheless, we keep our focus on the Lord. So just like they didn't believe in Jesus' ministry back then, a lot of people will not believe in you. A lot of people will shun you out from their life. A lot of people will dismiss you and say, that person has got nothing good to bring to me or bring to, you know, to the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, as, as long as God is not done with you, then no matter what people say, it does not matter. You should not give a rip about what they say, right? So that's also a means of actually preventing offense. When you, you know, take in the information without getting offended, instead you take it up to God. You think whatever people say about you, you say, Lord, is this true? Because sometimes people might be saying things to you that God wants to say to you. It's not always, you know, they're not always saying things uh, uh, that are not a fit for you. So don't dismiss everything that they say, right? But think whatever they say and bring it to God. Don't get offended, all right? And a lot of other times people will say things like, you shouldn't even walk them, right? And so be quick to dismiss those because if you know who you are in the Lord, no one is allowed to bring you down and say something else, all right? So 
criticism is something that a lot of us also hate receiving, right? When we get criticized over something, we get offended, right? Whether it be an exhortation, whether it be a, a correction or a gentle rebuke by a brother or sister, because suppose someone is doing something wrong. Suppose, you know, they're sinning, but they're not aware that they're sinning. So instead of being a stumbling block for others in your church, you know, this brother or this sister that perceives it, they come up to you in private and they gently correct you or exhort you. Don't be so quick to dismiss it. Instead, you know, you know, take the, the exhortation. Take, take the word, especially if they're doing it gently with grace, right? That's how you know that it comes from God. Because if someone is going to beat you down with drums over your head, then you know that that's, that, that's definitely not from God. But if it's, if, if it's, it's said nicely, with grace, if the approach is gentle and that person truly cares for you because there's kind of a pattern of history with them where they always cared for you, then take it and say, you know what, I might be wrong about what I'm doing, right? I might have to change this area of my life. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't allow criticism from brothers and sisters, especially if it's gentle, loving, if it's caring, if it's uh, done with good motives, build offense in your heart. Don't get offended, all right? Amen? Matthew 13, 53 to 58. <clears throat> you know what? We actually covered this. Just for the sake of time, let's go to, uh, to a different one. Let's go to Matthew eleven six 6 instead. 11, 6, please. Jesus said, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished this parable. Uh, no, I want to go to Matthew eleven six, 6, please. Okay. Jesus said, Blessed is you, whosoever shall not be offended in me. All right? Whoever shall not be offended in me. Brothers and sisters, don't be offended in Christ as well. Right? Go and teach about Christ. Go and tell about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to share this because you guys, I mean, I don't even know at this point if you guys are still Muslims or if you're, if you love the, I don't know, right? But I'm just telling you this. I'm, I'm sharing my own experience lovingly and, and respectfully. You know, for, for some years at the beginning of my walk with the Lord, because I had been dismissed by my family, disowned by a lot of people because of my conversion to Christianity, because I, I'm an ex-Muslim, um, a lot of people wage war against me. A lot of other people were, were nice to me. They accepted right, the, the reality of my choice. But, but because of the amount of persecution that I was undergoing, sometimes, you know, I get offended in Christ. I was like Peter, right? I was walking around with a cross. And if I saw someone who I knew or my mother knew who happened to be a Muslim, right, I'd seek to actually hide away from that person just so they wouldn't see the cross hanging around my neck. And so that was like, you know, the beginning of my walk within the first, you know, few years. Uh, I believe it was the first two years. I remember it was like something maybe around the second year after I came to the Lord. And sometimes I would even like see them from far. And if it's someone that, you know, I didn't want to break my head with, you know, and explaining why I'm, I made that choice, you know, I would hide my cross. And, and so... You know, I came to a point where, you know, God rebuked me on that gently. And he said, listen, don't be a Peter, right? Don't deny me. Instead, assume uh, your, 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 your choices. And, 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 and don't fear what people will say, right? Just go ahead with, 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 that, with that decision and, and I, will walk, I will walk every step along the way with you. I will protect you. You know, I'll, I'll use your mouth. I'll speak to these people and they'll, they'll get confounded. And I'm not, even, I'm not even kidding. When I did that, when I repented from, you know, such behavior, every time I'd come across someone that knew me as a Muslim, you know, and when they saw the cross, I was able to stand firm and stand tall in my faith. And God would use me to speak over the lives. And before you knew it, you know, a spark was born in them. Something would change. Right. It, it was my testimony now that was like sounding in their hearts and the very people that I thought were going to hate on me. They were the very people that were like, wow, you know, this is powerful. Right. What is going on? So don't ever underestimate what God can do in your life. 
and don't be offended in Jesus Christ, right? The offense is not for us believers. Instead, stand up for your faith. Stand tall against all persecution, against all condemnation, against all judgment, because Christ is worthy to stand for. Amen? More than anybody else, because he gave his life for us. The least that we can do is not deny him like Peter did, brothers and sisters. Amen? Something else that I wanted to say. An offense can also be a stumbling block, right? It can also be a stumbling block. Because when the offense comes at us, the purpose is to cause us to stumble, right? And notice that when the offense comes at us, it doesn't just stay there. There's other things that come with it, right? So you're offended, right? Now you're far from God, right? You're not perceiving God. You're not hearing the voice of God anymore. Now you start drifting away. You're so far off from the presence of God that now you're doing other sins, right? And now before you know it, well, you're on a downfall of sinfulness. You're spiraling down a pit of darkness, right? And offense could bring also adultery, idolatry, fornication, that's what we see that, you know, Christians that are not truly rooted in the Lord, whenever an offense comes down their way, it's so easy for them to fall apart. Hence the importance of always staying interconnected with the Lord in prayer and through the, through the reading of the word. Because it is God that fights our fight for us. Right? Amen? We are, we are of no match against the devil, brothers and sisters. I want you to know that. But the one that lives inside of you, has an overcoming power against the devil to root him out of your life. Amen? Let's turn to Matthew 18, 5 to 7. Bear with me, brothers and sisters. You know, we give meat here. We don't give milk. I don't know if you've been to different other churches. If you've been to other churches, you know, they might have given you milk. We give you meat here. We give you the T-bone steak, all right? I hope you like meat. Okay. Whoever receives one such child in my name, says Jesus, receives me. But whosoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Wow. 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 Jesus says, Woe to the world. For temptation to sin for it is necessary that temptation come but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes all right do you know why i'm going there look at me i'll tell you what look at me the reason why i'm going there is because temptation right could also be an offense okay i'll tell you how it could become an offense as a child of god Yes. Sorry. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs to be offended. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. I said, I said that. Yeah. So, so Jesus is saying, woe unto the world because of offenses. So Jesus is saying, in the world, there's going to be offenses. That's a given, all right? There's always going to be offenses, right? But then he goes on saying, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. So he's saying, cursed is that man, okay, that brings the offense. Now, offense equates to temptation as well, okay? If you're someone who's being a stumbling block to your brother or sister, you're offending them, all right? How? Suppose you're a believer and you come into church dressed up immodestly, very immodestly, all right? And if we have, let's say we, let's say we have people at church that are still wrestling with uh, lust or sexual immorality, right? you're becoming a stumbling block now for your brother. You're becoming a stumbling block for your sister. What is the greatest commandment? It's to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And the Bible also tells us don't do unto others what you wouldn't want others to do unto you. So if I want people to treat me this way, I need to treat them this way as well, right? So don't be a stumbling block for your brothers and sisters. 
Meaning that if you're going to do something which the Holy Spirit convicts you of not doing because it might be an offense to your brother, it might offend him and get him to actually be tempted to sin, then be careful. Think about it twice. Don't do it. Right? Because we are not to provoke one another like the Bible said earlier. All right? And so Christ takes this very seriously. He says, Woe to the one by whom offense comes. Don't be the person that creates that stumbling block in others. Be that person that lifts up your brothers and your sisters. Amen? Now, that could be a range of different things. From dressing modestly to your behavior, to the way you speak, the way you come off. There's a whole lot of stuff that could be said about this. For the sake of time, I'm going to have to cut short, unfortunately. But I want to, what I want to say is this. There's another way to actually not get offended, which is to renew our minds. Renew our minds, all right? Because a lot of us were quick-tempered. Somebody says something, we're so quick. Uh, 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 uh. No. The Bible says, don't be quick-tempered. Be prompt to listen, right? Slow to speak. That's in the book of James. Why? Because the tongue right, is a fiery thing that brings destruction, right? And remember what the Bible also says. Jesus said that out of the heart speaks the tongue. Let's be prompt to listen. And be careful to speak, right? A lot of us, we make that mistake that as soon as someone says something that does not fit our narrative, we get angry. We get quick-tempered. We want to jump the gun. And it's almost like we want to, ugh, you know, like, how could you say this? How, how do you dare say this? You got to be careful, all right? And no one is able to tame the tongue but God himself, Jesus Christ, who has the perfect tongue, amen? Brothers and sisters, there's no need for me to remind you that there's power in the tongue to either bless or curse. Remember how God created everything through his word. Kun faya kun, right? His word. Jesus Christ is the word that became flesh. Jesus created everything through the power of the word. So there is power with the word. There's power in the tongue to either destroy someone or build someone up. Bless someone or curse someone. And we are all guilty of speaking evil, of having cursed in the past, having sworn at someone, having, you know, answered with a temper, having been quick to anger. That ought not to be among us. All right. So let's ask God to tame our tongues. And let's be careful before we speak. Let's renew our minds and, you know, figure, okay, well, if I haven't learned a billion times before, maybe now I just, I just begin to learn to be, to be slow to speak. Amen? Because when you speak, you're speaking evil. And when you speak evil, that shows the nature of your heart. There's an offense there. But if you keep it inside... Whilst God sees that, he's able to work now. He's able to root it out because you're being obedient to his word. Amen? <clears throat> so, so far, what have you seen, brothers and sisters? I want you to stay with me, please. Please stay with me. I know it's, it's long, but that's the word of God. A lot of people would wish in Korea and China to hear the word for hours upon hours upon hours, don't they, right? Okay, I want you to stay with me here. So we said that God cannot perform a miracle in our life if we allow offenses to come. That's first thing first. Second, we said that an offense could hurt us, but hurt people around us as well, right? We also said that we have to renew our minds in the Lord, not to be offended. We said that we shouldn't be a stumbling block to others because that's a form of offense as well. Now I am saying again, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee away from you. Amen. Submission to the Lord is a means through which offense will be cut off from your life completely. Amen? Because Jesus said, it is impossible that no offenses should come. So Christ said, offenses will come, inevitably. They'll always come. You know, in other words, you can't get around them. But here's what you can do. 
is you can act differently. You can have a different attitude towards the offense. Don't get offended. Don't let offense take over. And now we're getting to my favorite part and the finality of my sermon. What do I do if I've been offended by someone? Well, first, what you don't do is you don't gossip. And you don't go tell the pastor everything right away. What you do is instead listen to Jesus' words in Matthew 18, 15 to 17 and verse 20. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear you, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And then it says, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. And then verse 20, if we skip over a couple of verses here, we're getting to the end of that passage. Here's what it says. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Brothers and sisters, the reason why Christ said this here is because Christ is basically underlining the importance of unity. Right? He's telling us where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Because he understands how much as human beings, right, we must create relationships. He understands that humans are to have relationships with others. Humans, we are to unify with others because God is a God of unity. And when we speak of unity, we speak of love. When we speak of relationships, there, where, where relationships are, there's love. So Christ is telling us, seek as much as it pertains to you to have a bond of peace with your brothers and sisters. Be unified with your brothers and sisters. And if you do, then I'll be in the midst of you. And so, if you have something against your brother, your sister, he tells us to go and speak to them privately, gently, lovingly. Tell them, you know, that you hurt me. I've got this against you, right? Don't wait until it grows inside of you and destroys your spiritual condition. Go up to them, speak to them, tell them about the wrongs privately. Try to make amends with them first. And if they're not willing to make amends, then go to your pastor. Go to someone else. Bring other people. You see, Matthew 18 is not a condemnation passage. Instead, it's a passage, it's a passage of love. Because a person is seeking to bring the other person back into the flock. If they're not willing, you're going the distance, you're bringing other people in. And if they're not willing, you're bringing the church in. Right? You want to try to do your best. You want to be above reproach to bring your brother or your sister back in. Especially if they're faulty against you and against the church. If they have done you something wrong, you go up to them and make amends with them. God is a God of unity. He's a God of love. Brothers and sisters, we must forgive 70 times 7, the Bible says. You know that. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, if my brother offends me, how many times should I forgive him? Seven times? You know, Peter probably thought that he was doing, you know, Jesus a favor. Or he was doing himself a favor. But Jesus responded and he said, you understood that, right? He said, no. You must forgive your brother 70 times 7. If your, if your brother offends you and comes to you and repents again and again and again and again, as long as he repents, you ought to take him in. And if you do have something against someone, don't you dare going, you know, laying your, 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 your gift at the altar of God. This speaks of prayer. Don't go into prayer expecting that your prayer will not be hindered or that God will listen to your prayer especially if you have something against someone. Go and make amends with your brother or with your sister before you bring your gift to the altar, right? Because what good is it for us if we are disunified with everybody else and then we seek to be unified to God? It doesn't make any sense. Because remember, the greatest of all commandments is not religion. No, do this, do that, do this, do that. Oh, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray. But then your heart is evil from the inside. You hate everybody. You're a violent man. All we see in your heart is just aggression and rage and anger, cursing people around. And then you're taking a gift up to God, expecting that God will listen to you. What kind of God is that? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an evil God. 
God wants us to be unified, to be love, right? And so if we're going to bring a gift to God, let's bring our gift to our brothers and sisters first. The gift of forgiveness. Because Jesus said the greatest of all commandments is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then love your neighbor second. Oh, wait a second. If I am to love my neighbor as I love myself, which is my brother and my sister, because they are my closest neighbors, then I must love God first because the love that I give to others comes from God. Because otherwise I can't love, right? Humans can't love without the love of God. No, you can't love someone. At best, you'll be a good person. It is God that loves through us. So my brothers and my sisters, let us not be offended. Let us find the cure for our offense. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is our cure. He is the antidote. And think about Christ and what he did on the cross. Christ, when he died on the cross, he even said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Even on the cross, under the worst form of persecution, Christ was still saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Christ was still praying for them. And in the rebellion, they were saying, if you're truly the Son of God, come down from the cross. If you say that you're Jesus, come down from the cross. Christ has, had made miracles in their synagogues. Christ had loved on them. Christ, just a week prior to his crucifixion, he was entering Jerusalem with a triumphant entry, mounted on the back of a donkey. And you had millions in Jerusalem welcoming Christ and saying, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet, a week later, they crucified him. That's the offense. That's the offense. Christ put up with all of their offenses. So no one would ever look back and say that Christ has not told us. Right? So let us never look back and say one day, Christ did not tell us, or the Bible did not say or someone did not tell us, don't get offended. Because Christ, in the face of adversity, did not revile. He did not do evil. He forgave. Brothers and sisters, let us seek to forgive others. Which, by the way, no one except Christ teaches. Forgiveness is in Christ and Christ alone. Amen. He forgave us our sins and we are to forgive others. Because if you don't forgive, God is not going to forgive us our sins. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just pray for a minute together.